All right, so today's service call, I get to chase a ghost. So I got a call from a customer. They're like, I've had five electricians or whatever, however many electricians out. There's some plug that's doing this weird thing. There's got, it's like got some weird voltage or something. I don't know. Can you come out and look at it? And I'm like, all right, hold up. The first thing I do when I get a call from somebody like this is I try to get as much answered as possible. I'm gathering, I have a lot of unknowns that I'm trying to like whittle those down to a list of knowns. And you'll find here in a minute when I'm actually at the job that that's the same methodology that I keep. I always try to get as many knowns, gather as much, even if it's too much extra information, doesn't matter the more data, the better, because you're gonna eventually get it down to the parts you don't know and you can't find and you have to make an informed, educated guess sometimes. So I just started asking questions. I was like, all right, so when you say weird voltage, does that mean like, like 40 volt, like what does weird voltage mean to you? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Like usually it's supposed to say 120 and it doesn't say 120. And I'm like, well, is it 120 between hot and neutral? Or like, what are you testing? And they're like, well, I didn't actually test anything. It was like a helper of the like carpentry guy. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna rely on anything you're telling me. Like this is something I'm actually gonna have to verify when I get out there. So I was like, is there any other places in the house? You know, I started to just try to like build a picture of what was happening. They're like, yeah, there's some lights that are flickering all of a sudden in the last like day or two. They weren't doing that before. There's some light switches that just stopped working. And uh, I was like, okay, well, is there construction that's happening? Are these guys doing anything in that area? And they're like, yeah, you know, they're working right above it. There's a, a bathroom floor that way they just like remodeled the whole bathroom. And I was like, all right, well, they probably fucked something up. You know, like, honestly, that's the most likely thing. Um, so anyways, I got all of that information together and I set up a time to go out there and meet them. So when I got on site, the first thing that I did is I needed to map out the affected area. So really, uh, I needed to start to kind of like build a picture in my mind of what I think is going on. And to do that, I needed to start asking a lot of questions and trying to figure out. So I asked the homeowner, what's going on? Like, what's the, what's the biggest thing that you noticed? Um, and the first thing they talked about was this plug with the weird voltage. So I was like, all right, let's start there. Um, it was in kind of a central location in the house, but it was, you know, in the kitchen. And so I uh, went over to it, stuck my plug tester in it, and it said hot and ground reverse. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, that might be like a simple, problem and I stuck my multimeter in, but I started to get weird voltages. So this was the crazy thing. I was getting like 10 volts hot to ground. I was getting nothing between hot and neutral and between neutral and ground, I was getting 120 volts. So I was like, that's extra weird. <laughs> so like somebody, maybe somebody was in here and they took some things apart and put some like a switch back in and messed up the wiring that happens all the time, especially with helpers of carpenters that shouldn't be doing electrical work, but that are, because they're just trying to cover something they took apart. You know, like that shit happens all the time. So anyways, I started building this affected area. And if you can imagine this house, when you walk in the front door, immediately to the left, there's a kitchen. There's a few countertop receptacles in the kitchen for, you know, the like um, the toaster and uh, the, the coffee maker. Then there's a refrigerator and there's this one plug that's down at like knee height. Everything else is countertop receptacles in the kitchen, but there's just this one random plug down here. And then he said, well, there's the, the other problems that we're having are kind of across into the dining room, across the house by the patio. There's a back patio door. There's a switch next to that uh, door. And then uh, near that, there's also a bathroom and this bathroom and the patio door, evidently he was, were where he was saying the lights actually worked before and now they just don't work. And some of them were flickering sometimes. And he said, the last thing that I noticed is that our garage lights don't work. And it was the same thing with these LED strips that are just kind of like tacked up on the ceiling. And there's a receptacle in the ceiling that we plug into. And they used to work just fine like last couple of weeks. And, and like now they, they flickered a bunch one day and now they just don't work at all. So I was like, all right, something has changed in this circuit from the last couple of weeks. That's helpful information to know. I always ask people, how long has it been like this? Is this something like that's for like the last three years or you guys just have never seen it work? Or is this something in the last three days? Because that gives you a lot of information. You know, these guys were up there in the last three days. Three years ago, these guys weren't up there, you know? So like, it's just honing in. You're just gathering data. The more questions you can ask when you're trying to troubleshoot something, the better. So again, I'm just, right now, all I'm doing, trying to do is map the entire area so I know like, 
Well, over by this patio, it makes sense. The light doesn't work, but it also right next to it, the bathroom lights don't work. And right next to that, the garage lights don't work. So I'm like, this is all probably one thing. And I'm like, this over here, the plug in the kitchen, that might that might be a different thing. It very well could could be the way it was being explained and the time frame and everything. It seemed like that was probably a separate problem. So once I got all of that mapped out, I started to try to figure out where the electrical panels were because I just wanted to know kind of the possibility of what direction some of these wires might be coming to and going from since everything's above sheetrock or in walls and I can't see any of it. Now, one thing to think about is working safely while you're troubleshooting. So troubleshooting, this is a time where you're coming into an already energized environment and you're going to be using test equipment on live circuits, working with live circuits. So this is an environment where I think it's a good idea just to talk about working live and whether or not we should or shouldn't do it. So you have to understand that when you're going in to diagnose a problem, you need the circuit to be energized. So you need to be able to test things and open things up to be able to put your your multimeter on things to test to see if things are energized or not and to be able to get readings but there's a point where you're troubleshooting and you found all of your values and now it's time to start opening things up and and like disassembling conductors before you do that that is the time to go shut the circuit off a lot of people would just keep it live the whole time and just keep blowing through, but that's where you run into problems. You'll forget that it was live. You'll think that you tripped a GFI, but it actually isn't tripped or the homeowner heard it trip and they didn't realize what you were doing and they just went over and reset it. Like it's not worth the risk of you getting electrocuted because like, I know people are like, well, it's 120 volts. It doesn't really matter. No, dude, 120 volts can kill your ass. 120 volts can kill your ass. 120 volts can kill your ass. Like for real, less voltage than that can kill you. So it just depends on how much resistance you offer to a circuit, how much current's going through you, where it's going through, if it's going through your heart, there's a whole bunch of things, but just minimizing the amount of risk, it's stupid to work on stuff live if you don't have to. If you have to, that's different. Wear good PPE, all that jazz. You guys hear me talk about this all the time. All I'm trying to get at is that when you're troubleshooting things, know that you're going to have to work on stuff that's live for a certain point to get your values. But then, as soon as you don't have to have the power on anymore, kill the power, then start working on all your stuff and don't turn the power back on until you're done, until everything's safe again and then you're verifying again on a live circuit when everything's finished. Conveniently, the sub panel was located right on the other side of the countertop GFCI. So I knew where the home run was in the kitchen area. And since this one receptacle was in the kitchen area, I was really hoping that this was on a GFCI circuit. So I hit that little test button on my GFCI tester and it tripped the countertop receptacles. And I thought I was like, well, there's a there's a possibility if this is wired in a haggard weird way and there's some kind of wires mixed up that that's not even the same circuit. It could be a different circuit and it's just, it's tripping because this thing is sending a signal to that GFCI through the ground or some, you know, some kind of weird thing. So I wasn't hundred percent solid that it was on that circuit. And the reason is because this whole weird voltage problem on this one receptacle was not the same on all the countertops. All the countertop receptacles, when I put my uh, multimeter in, they read just how they were supposed to. 120 hot to neutral, 120 hot to ground, and nothing neutral to ground. Beautiful. All of these receptacles were like this. They were all fine. But this thing kept tripping those GFIs. So I was like, all right, there's a, there's a good likelihood that this is the same circuit. And it's a kitchen circuit, GFI protection, you know, like it makes sense. So the next thing that I thought to do was to get my circuit tracer out. So I've got a low voltage network toner that uh, when you hook it up, it emits a tone in the wand when the wand is near the conductor. So you hook this toner up to conductors uh, somewhere and then you can drag this wand along the wall, along the ceiling, and it'll actually squeal when you're next to the wire that it is hooked up to. So I love this tool. This is a good pro tip.
So for a pro tip, one thing to understand about these toners is they can be somewhat unreliable from time to time. And it takes a little bit of practice to get used to how to use them properly. You'll find that older houses like, you know, 60s, 70s, even 80s houses, a lot of them were wired very differently than the way that we have started wiring things in the 90s, 2000s, and today. Um, so the codes and standards for those eras were different. So you'll notice that going into a 1970s home, there's neutrals tied together everywhere through the entire house. Every switch is tied to every light. There's junction boxes. It's like all one massive neutral through the whole house. Now each conductor, each actual hot might be, you know, in a, a home run that goes in and that, like that's kept isolated, but the neutrals were just all connected. A lot of the grounds and stuff were too. So when you hook up a toner to a black and a white conductor, you'll notice sometimes that you'll get a signal, but it's really faint and it's weird. And it seems like it goes to like six different places and that's because it is. So you have this nine volt battery that's sending a signal, this nine volts, through the conductors that your wand is picking up on. So if it's sending, say it's sending like uh, this signal going out on the black conductor, well, the signal coming back on the neutral is not coming straight back like it's going straight out. It's coming into wherever these neutrals split out and it's going to all of these locations. So that signal fades. There's a voltage drop that's happening in this tester. So you're gonna get like weird readings. You're gonna be like, why is this black wire over here like toning like crazy? But the white that's coming out of the same sheathing is not making any noise or it's like really, really quiet. Or why is every one of these things toning out? Like it should just go from here to a place. But you'll just notice that using these things, especially in older era homes, they're really unreliable. So you have to kind of go over to continuity testing just to verify your results. Now this home that I'm working on was built in the 90s, so it's really not that off. Everything in the 90s and, and on is pretty much wired the same from one electrician to another within reason. We kind of run a home run to a plug or to a switch, and then we go out from the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. It's all pretty much the same. So what I did is I took my toner out and I went to that first receptacle. And since I couldn't really figure out where it was going any logical way, I had to tone out the path. So I followed it up a wall, I was getting a pretty good tone, and then I got to this spot in the ceiling where it just disappeared. So I was like, why is that disappearing right there? Am I just like, is it going up a wall upstairs maybe? And it just keeps going up. And uh, I asked the homeowner, they're like, no, there's no wall anywhere around there. So I'm like, all right, well, that's kind of weird. So I opened up the receptacle and I took the device off and I put the white and the black conductor together under a wire nut. That basically makes the black and white that from one location back to that same location, it makes a loop by connecting those two. So when I go to this side and I test on the black and the white for a loop, I can send a signal down the black since it's wire nutted to the white, it comes back on the white. So I should be able to get a reading. So I, I did, I put a, a continuity tester on the other end when I opened that um, last plug up that was on that GFCI countertop series of plugs. Um, I found the other end of it. So I was like, oh, okay. So even though I can't like with my wand find this conductor over here, I know with my multimeter through using continuity that this plug and this plug are touching. This is one continuous piece of wire. Now it may go up and do some other crazy shit somewhere else. Who knows? I can't see that, but I do know that that goes from here to here at least. So that was a good starting point. So now that I figured that out, I was like, all right, well, let me take my toner over here. I'll take the continuity off. I'll take all my joints apart and let me hook the toner up on this side and see if I can get, uh, you know, from here over to that other plug. And there was just something weird in the middle. So I did, I took my wand, I hooked everything up and I got a, a good solid tone all the way over to the same exact spot. And it just disappeared again. I was like, okay, what's going on in this area? What is here? that's making me lose all this. And I'm like doing big sweeps all the way around the area and not catching it anywhere else. So I was like, all right, it's time to move on. So now I know that the first half of this circuit is not reading the same voltage, but it is still tied to the problem. So from there, we jump in this direction towards all of these problems we're having and all of a sudden there's problems. So there's something in the middle. There's all the good clean stuff, there's all the crap. And there's this spot in the middle that I'm losing 
my my signal. So now I start moving further and I take that wand and I just go, okay, I know there's an issue there and I'm not finding it. Let's see where else I do find it. So now I just started to move towards the other problems that the homeowner was telling me were there. And sure as shit, I started getting closer and all of a sudden, beep, 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 beep. I start hearing that tone and I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. So this one wire tones out over here, over here, and it's toning out over here. And I go over to the bathroom, it's toning out there. And I go into the garage and it's toning out there. So I was like, I bet there's a junction box in that ceiling somewhere, or they made a joint in one of the recessed cans, but I was I was losing the signal by the can. It was a few feet away from that where I was losing the signal. But I was like, I bet there's a junction box. I would still imagine I would get a tone coming to that junction box, but I don't know, sometimes there's weird materials and things get in the way. So I just took a guess at this point. I was like, I get verified there's a whole bunch of fuckery on this half of the circuit and I've verified everything over here is clean and cool and I got a problem spot in the middle. So I noticed there was a recessed can that was a six inch can. It was big enough for me to fit my head inside of and actually look. So I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna take that recessed can trim out. I'm gonna take the actual can housing itself. There's three little screws in almost every single one of these cans. Um, if it's a new construction, like a nail on kind of can, you can actually take the tube completely out and that lets you get to the junction box to work on wires if you ever have to in the future. So I put my head up in there and I saw this huge coil, just ball of wire up there, just Romex, just a big old knot of it. And I'm like, okay, so, something's here. <laughs> so I start pulling all of the slack down and I hear this clunk, clunk, clunk. And I'm like, yeah, there's a J box up there and a metal one. I know that for sure. Like I know that clunk. And so I stuck my phone up in the hole and took some pictures and sure as shit, there was a four inch octagon box um, just sitting up there made, and, and with joints made in it. And so I started to try to pull to get the box over into the hole that I was in to work on it, but I didn't have any slack to pull my direction. I had tons of slack to pull the other way. I just didn't have any slack. So I was like, fuck, like I have to cut this ceiling. There's nothing I can do. There was a vent nearby and I thought like maybe if it was like a soft vent or something, I might be able to like get it loose and pop it up and do everything right there because that was right next to where the joint was. But it wasn't, it was a hard duct and the way that those things are mounted, there's these little uh, straps that are pinched in from the sheetrock to the studs, to the floor trusses. So there's no way I was gonna get this thing off. Even if I tried to cut, you know, like two sides, I couldn't get around to the other side to cut the other strap. So it was just, I was screwed. So I told the homeowner, I was like, all right, so this is what I found. I think I've found everything. And I think I have a pretty positive diagnosis for you. Um, I am like 90% positive that this junction box is our problem. Probably 98% positive uh, with a 2% chance that they're like, this still may not fix the fucking problem. So I was like, I, I gotta cut a hole in here to get to these wires, but you need to know if I cut a hole here, it may not fix the fucking problem because I can't see anything. I can't open the junction box to see what the problem is. So it may not be there. It may be like, maybe there's another junction box somewhere that I'm not seeing and it jumps out, you know, like who knows? Um, so, but I did the due diligence. I went to every location. I yanked on these wires and I could see them going in all of the directions that they should. One of the wires went down to this crazy plug and I yanked on it and I saw the wire actually move and the plug moved. So I was like, all right, well, I know that's that wire. And then the other one disappeared in the same direction going over to that switch and I couldn't see it move or anything, but I was like, for a fair guess, I'm pretty sure that's where it goes. But again, this, this box was hooked up and it was so far over that I couldn't reach it. I couldn't open it. I couldn't work on it. I had to cut the hole just to get access to this box, just to fucking work on the thing. Now, the other thing to note is since I didn't have access to this J box, I couldn't take readings from any of these other conductors. I knew that when I turned the circuit on, all of them got hot and they showed weird voltages. Uh, and I knew when I shut it off, they all shut off together. But without getting into this junction box, I really couldn't do any other kind of diagnostics to it. So the solution that I came up to, I thought was kind of creative. I looked in the kitchen and I'm like, bro, your recessed cans are really not spaced out in any sort of awesome way. Um, it's kind of like, they're just kind of placed randomly. 
So I was like, what if we just add another recess can right there where that damn junction box is? I could cut a new six inch hole, get a recess, uh, you know, remodel can, put a remodel can up there. That would allow me to use the junction box for making joints in that would give people access and it would make the you know everybody the code gurus happy because now it's an accessible joint so on that note let's look and see what it says in the national electric code for splices and junction boxes and stuff like that 314.29 boxes conduit bodies and handhold enclosures shall be installed so that wiring contained in them can be rendered accessible in accordance with 314.29 a and b now under a it says in buildings and other structures that's us we're in a structure and a building says boxes and conduit bodies shall be installed so the contained wiring can be accessed without removing any part of the building or structure without having to cut a fucking hole in the ceiling <laughs> so the last electrician did not do it to code they didn't make all of this stuff accessible and it needs to be accessible every recessed can has a box mounted to it so if the wires going into that box are okay for us to make joints in and they're considering the removal of that can to access this junction box as accessible then any other conductors that we want to put in this box are also accessible if we use that box Fun fact, did you know that you no longer have to put recessed cans in anymore? So uh, in my house, and generally when I'm doing a remodel, I'll put stuff like this in. So if you see from the picture, it's essentially uh, a can trim that has a housing on it. So I bought like 30 of these to put in my house. But the only thing that you need, there's the enclosure right here. This is where your wires go. You can still select, you know, a bunch of different colors. Again, like these are, everybody's making color changing or color selecting uh, recess cans now. But what's really cool is when you're in remodel environments like I'm in right now, I could have just taken one of these and stuck it up there or found one that's like a six inch version. And all you have to do is just hook right up to the junction box. You just stick it up in the hole like this and these fingers snap down and pinch it on the sheetrock and keep it in place. This is wicked. Like, I really don't use recessed cans anymore or any like remodel uh, style cans anymore. I just use this kind of stuff. But in this situation, he already had six inch existing cans and can trims that he had already bought. So I had to do something that would match it. And the only way to match it was to get a remodel can. But I recommend everybody stops putting remodel cans in. They just suck. You don't have to. This is super profile, like low profile. There's even like slimmer versions where the where this um, junction box is not mounted to the can. It's like remote, so you can even get more slimline stuff that will fit like right underneath a stud. So you can literally put them everywhere now. There it doesn't matter if you cut a hole and it's like, oh damn it, there's a piece of wood. Doesn't matter. These things are so low profile. But anyways, I figured I would share that with you because I hate remodel cans and I think a lot of other people do too. <laughs> So what I did is once I cut the hole in the ceiling, I saw the junction box right there exactly where I cut this hole out and I opened it up. The wire nut for the neutral was melted. Um, you actually see the metal exposed for the spring inside the wire nut and then the neutral conductors themselves, the insulation had melted together on all of the conductors. Now I didn't actually see any place where there was uh, a hot conductor touching a neutral or a ground touching a hot or anything to give us that weird potential that we were getting between neutral and ground and for there to not be any potential between hot and neutral. I just didn't see anything. Once I started to move the joints around, you know, I may have actually changed the situation, which that's always that's always a, a, a concern, right? A lot of inexperienced people will just start going and breaking things open and taking plugs apart and taking switches apart. And a lot of times that ends up like screwing everything up and it moves the problem somewhere else. But I knew that this was my problem right away. I just saw the melted wires as it was. So when I started moving all of that stuff, I just stuck my plug tester in down below just to, because I was curious. And I started wiggling everything around and I, st I started seeing my plug tester, the lights just started going crazy on it. And I was like, okay, it's just a loose joint. So I'm getting some weird voltage readings 
because there's a loose joint and it's traveling and probably going in a different direction. So I don't know that the actual voltage readings that I was getting were true voltage readings. It may have been kind of a ghost voltage situation um, based off of the, the overall resistance of the, the, of the length of these conductors and where they run, who knows? The, I don't, I didn't care about that. I verified that wiggling this stuff around, I found the loose joints, I found the melted wire nuts, and I saw that it messed with the actual circuitry when I wiggled it. So then once I got all the lights like on, like they should be where it didn't show there was any reversals or anything, it just showed my hot neutral and ground were all wired correctly. I went down there with my multimeter and the voltage was just fine. It corrected itself just by me jiggling everything. So I was like, all right, well, here we go. So I took everything apart stuck all the new conductors and the existing conductors into that junction box, made up all the joints, and then I left it hang there for a minute. I didn't want to put this thing back up in the hole until I went down and verified that it fixed everything. So I went down, checked the plug again. We had good voltage, solved the problem. Everything was good to go. Went over to the patio switch, flipped it on, light turned on beautifully. Went into the bathroom, flipped it on, light turned on, went into the garage, flipped it lights came on. I was like, golden, solved the problem. Um, so most of the problem was just trying to find this weird problem that existed. Um, but the actual fix itself was, was pretty easy to do. One thing I did do is because I had a receptacle in the ceiling of the garage and there were LED lights hooked up to it, I didn't want to just assume that I had fixed the problem everywhere else. I really only took the voltage reading at this first plug. So what I did is I went to every one of the devices that was affected and I checked the voltage there too. Even though I knew it was all working, it was probably fine. Just check, like you're, you're already there. Um, it, it's worthwhile to check. Got clean 120 between hot and ground, hot and neutral. Got nothing between uh, ground and neutral. So everything was good to go. Um, I put everything back together and then I put this can back up in the hole. The homeowner actually got brand new uh, recessed can trims um, and they had like adjustable uh, colors on them. So there was different Kelvin ranges, which I love, like all, all recess cans now should have that. And they're starting to make more and more of them with them that way. But that way you can control the color spectrum. If you want more cool light, if you want more warm light or whatever, if you like that like sterile hospital bluish white, you can have it. Um, so we just put all new recessed can trims in, got everything back together and cleaned up. Now you'll notice as I am cleaning up that I put down a a uh, moving blanket or like a drop cloth. I always keep a drop cloth with me in my truck, in my van. Um, and it's something that I keep under me when I'm working, especially when I'm working overhead doing dirty stuff. I'm in somebody's kitchen, you know? I, you know, the last thing you want to do is be so inconsiderate that you just start cutting and there's sheetrock all over and they eat off these tables and they're prepping food. It's like, it's such a like irritating thing to watch somebody work that has no care for the environment that they're working in and it doesn't think about the people that they're doing work for even if it's their business if it's their office they got paperwork and their nice computer and everything cover all of that stuff if you're gonna make a mess like try to minimize the mess as much as possible and them watching you they're gonna be like oh my gosh this person's so professional like holy cow i can't believe like most people that come in don't do stuff like this this person's gonna like they're so good at what they do it just gives them confidence when you hand the bill in at the very end that you did a really good job and that you cared and you were professional so just something i recommend in this situation i got to cut that hole all the sheetrock dust fell down onto that blanket i rolled the blanket up and i took the entire mess outside with me i didn't have to clean up i didn't have to vacuum i didn't have to sweep it was very, very controlled the area of, of dirtiness that I created. All right, so that's all I got for you. Uh, please leave some comments below if there's different methodologies that you guys use, if there's anything that you would have done instead. Uh, I love hearing all of the different ways that people kind of push logic through to find solutions for things. Um, thank you guys so much for the 480 Volt members that support me constantly. All of these people, some of your names have been on there for quite a while. Don't think that I don't notice. Really appreciate you guys constantly supporting what I do. If you're interested in joining the channel membership, there's a little button below. Click the subscribe button, click the like button, click the uh, notification bell thingy, follow me on all the socials. Love you crazy fuckers. I'll see you soon.
best can music and video.